Okay. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. So today our, our, uh, our topic is the foundation of God's government. This is a port, an important one because as Christians we need to understand what God's government is all about. The memory verse today is, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to wait, make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Lisa, would you pray for us today Absolutely. as we start our lesson? Yep. Dear <clears throat> Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for bringing us together this beautiful Sabbath day, for setting this time apart that we may come together as a community to worship you. Um, I pray that your Holy Spirit will descend upon us as we open up your word and discuss and learn. I pray that those truths that are really important for each one to hear and understand that you will make them clear. I know that for each person that may be different, and, but, but you are a God of everything and, and you can touch our hearts in ways that no, no other thing can. So thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. I pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So when we look at the biblical themes of the great controversy and the heavenly sanctuary, they're inseparably woven with the theme of God's law and of his Sabbath, which is included in the law. In fact, the great controversy started with Lucifer's, Lucifer's accusations against God. What did he say about God? He, he said that God could not be trusted and that God could not be fair. And that nobody can keep God's law. Yeah. So, um, and he did this because it's the core, literally the core of, of God's government. So, ultimately, this blasphemous proposition constitutes the clear desire to exclude God from our lives and our relationship. That's Satan's desire, even from the universe. Mm -hmm. For this reason, our insistence upon the validity of the law of God is not a matter of legalism or salvation by works, but inasmuch as God's law is the expression of his character and the law stands at the core of the great controversy itself. Have you ever noticed <clears throat> with the Ten Commandments, Christians are like, it's okay to keep all the commandments until you get to the Sabbath. Then if, you're, if you, you say, oh, I worship on Sabbath, they go, oh, you're a legalist. So it's, it's really interesting that, that people can take the fourth commandment out of the law, but yet be so insistent on keeping the other nine. Yeah. I find that, that most interesting. Yeah. So defending God's law is defending his character and his status as creator and rightful king of the universe enthroned in his heavenly sanctuary. Upholding God's law mean that we understand that God is the only source of moral standard and meaning of life. Abandoning God and his principles of life lead to chaos and to eternal death. For this reason, Adventists proclaim the following Bible truths. And I want to go over these truths here for a second. Um, first is the immutability of God's law. What does immutability mean? Cannot be changed. Can be yeah, it yeah. can't. It can't be changed. Immutability is, really means that it can't. It can't be changed in any way. The Sabbath, <clears throat> as the sign of God's creatorship and kingship. It's it's interesting because um, God's creatorship culminates with the Sabbath. He did everything, and then he rested. And he rested as an example to us, didn't he? It was, it was an example for us. And it memorializes his, his authority. Um, the heavenly sanctuary is the seat of God's government and of salvation in the universe. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get in more to the sanctuary today. We, did, we got into it a bit last week. Mm -hmm. Uh, in last week's lessons, we'll, be, we'll get a little deeper into it today. And the Adventist movement, as the remnant church, call to proclaim 
God's last, last invitation to humanity to return to his kingdom. So the centerpiece of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the three angels' messages that we see in Revelation 14. These messages indicate the great controversy is a choice between two diametrically opposed principles, the devil's, which leads to perdition, and God's, which leads to life. Mm -hmm. So we see that they're, they're completely uh, opposed. Um, some of the th uh, lesson themes that we're going to look at this week is the law of God, which includes the Sabbath. It's eternal, immutable, because it represents God's character and status as creator and king of the universe and his principles for life and relationship. The heavenly sanctuary is the seat of God's government and of his salvation. The great controversy started because of Lucifer's impulse to usurp the status and authority. And toward the end of the great controversy on earth, God called forth the established, his remnant church. God's commit commissioned his remnant church to proclaim the final cry of mercy to members of humanity, inviting them to embrace him as creator, sur mm -hmm. savior and Lord, and is the only source and the only way. As you look at all of this, of God's government, and as we're getting close to the end and the three angels' messages, it really boils down to one thing. Who are you going to worship? Mm -hmm. It's really all about worship. Do we believe in God's government or, don't we, or do we believe in Satan's government? Mm -hmm. And that's really where um, the, the rubber meets the road. And we've, we've all read um, Revelations 6.12. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. And so we see that this, this whole issue of worship <clears throat> is so important as we look at, um, at God's government. So Satan's aim from the beginning was to thwart the worship of God through undermining his law. He knows that to offend in one point, we are guilty of how much? All things. Everything. Mm -hmm. We're guilty of all, aren't we? And so James uh, 2.10 says, for whoever shall keep the holy law yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. So he encourages uh, people to transgress God's law. Satan hates the Sabbath because it reminds people of the creator and how he is to be worshiped. But it is also enshrined in God's law and the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Because the law is what defines sin as long as people seek to be faithful to God, then his law must continue to be valid, including the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. So as we get into this lesson, we're going to look at God's law more. We're going to look at the Sabbath and the coming crisis of the mark of the beast. So um, also, this week, we were to read uh, Great Controversy uh, 25 through 27 for this lesson. So if we, if, we, if we read all these or listen to all these, we'll get through the whole book um, this quarter. Okay, that'd be great. Yes, and so, Elisa, you're going to okay, talk yeah. so, about um, the Sabbath. No, you're going to talk the Sabbath. But understanding that the law of God is the foundation of his government should not be a stretch of the imagination for us. Pretty much every country on the planet today their foundation of the <coughs> government is based on their set of laws and their authority, right? So for the United States, it's the Constitution, right? Our founding fathers put the Constitution in place so that, you know, going forward, the country would be governed based on that Constitution, knowing that laws would be, continue to be created, but those laws should align back to the Constitution and amplify the Constitution. In God's government, it's no different, only for the fact that it's perfect. 
God's law is perfect, God's government is perfect, it's inspired. Um, earthly ones are not. But yet, we should understand that the foundation of any government, any effective government, is, is its laws and its, its authority. So um, when we talk about on Sunday the sanctuary and the law, we're, we're going to connect the dots between how the example of the sanctuary, the, the type of what is in heaven given to Moses, how the sanctuary and the law were so important to the foundation of God's government and the, the, for the people to understand who God was and what he desired of them. So you'll recall that the sanctuary was divided into three parts. There was the courtyard that had the altar of sacrifice and the laver of water. Then there was the holy place, which had the seven-branch candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And then there was the third compartment called the most holy place. And what was in the third compartment? The Ark of the Covenant, right? Yeah, so what and do we mean? Yes. So what do we mean by the Ark of the Covenant and what was contained in the Ark of the Covenant? So you mentioned the Ten Commandments, right? But let's have the Bible explain this a little bit. Let's go to Exodus 25, 16. If we have that. <clears throat> okay. So um, God here speaking to Moses said, And you shall put into the Ark the testimony which I will give you. Okay, what was the testimony? That's right. It was the Ten Commandments. Let's go to Exodus 31, 18, please. All right. It says, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So the Ten Commandments, why were they written on stone? Permanency. Permanency, yeah. This was not something that was just going to be here for a year and go away. This was meant to be eternal. And why did God write it with his own finger? His law. His it's his word. law and his character. Yeah. There, there was to be no um, misinterpretation of what his law was, right? Uh, let's take a look at Exodus 25, 8 and 9. <coughs> yeah, so we're going to look at here, why did God give Moses such specific instructions then for building the sanctuary and the Ark of the Covenant? So um, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so that you shall make it. So God says it's a pattern. It's a pattern of what? It's a pattern of what's in heaven, right? Let's look at Hebrews 8.5. It says, who, shall, who served the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle? For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So the earthly sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly dwelling of God, right? And the most holy place represented the, the presence of God, right, on his throne, and, and his law. In Revelation eleven nineteen, if we have that one. <clears throat> it says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. So it tell, the Bible tells us that in heaven, in the presence of God at his throne, the Ark of the Covenant is seen in his temple, right? So his law is in, in, uh, um, it, enshrined with his throne there. And I like how the King James Version uh, describes the scene in the atmosphere. It says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Right, so it ties back to the um, Old Testament when it talks about the Testament, and it also tells us that these thunderings um, were voices. Right, 
Uh, so in the innermost part of the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, was the Ark of the Covenant. It's God's testimony, or the Ten Commandments. His covenant with his people. The earthly copy was written on stone and by the finger of God. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about the sanctuary and judgment. So one day a year, there was a day of atonement. What was the day of atonement? Remember that? So that was when the high priest would enter the most holy place to make atonement for sin. This was a solemn day of judgment, and all Israel was commanded to take part by repentance, soul-searching, and refraining from all work. Leviticus 23, 27, 28 says... Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on the same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. On this one day a year, the high priest entered the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. Within the ark was God's Ten Commandments written on stone. The golden cover of the ark was also called the mercy seat, where the blood was sprinkled to cleanse the sanctuary from sin. Every sacrifice offered revealed God's mercy towards sinful human beings. But the Day of Atonement shows that the record of sin remains until the Day of Judgment, which is the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement, or the Day of Judgment, is really good news for God's people. Right? Because Christ stands in their place before God during that judgment, and they are seen as perfect before God. And then their sin is cast forever. No, no remembrance of it after that. In Hebrews 10, 3 to 5, if you have that one, it says, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, that being Jesus, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. So it's only through Christ's blood, his sacrifice, that we are able to be forgiven uh, of our sins, because he stood in our place. So sin can only be removed through faith in the blood of Christ, which cleanses us from sin and stands in our place during the judgment. Um, if you haven't read Zechariah 3 in a while, I, I do encourage you to go and take a look at that again. It's a really good um, example of, of a person standing in judgment before God and um, opens, really opens our understanding of that. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, please. Okay, so this says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So it is during the judgment in God's presence that mercy and justice beautifully combine on behalf of God's people. So you remember, sin is transgression of the law. It's the transgression of God's law, the only law that matters. It can only be taken away through the blood of Christ, who paid that ultimate price for us, right? So we have that great, um, you know, um, merciful sa Savior, Redeemer, and the one who sanctifies us and, and enables us to stand before God, before a holy God. Ellen White says, this is my closing remark on this topic, Ellen White says in Great Controversy 434, uh, within the Holy of Holies in the sanctuary in heaven, the divine law is sacredly enshrined, and that law that was spoken by God himself amid the, amid the thunders of Sinai and written with his own finger on the tables of stone. The law of God in the sanctuary in heaven is the great original, of which the precepts inscribed upon the tables of stone and recorded by Moses in the Pentateuch were an unerring transcript. 
Those who arrived <laughs> at an understanding of this important point were thus led to see the sacred, unchanging character of the divine law. Early Adventist believers, as they studied the sanctuary and law of God, reasoned that if the law of God was pictured in the Ark of the Covenant in the heavenly sanctuary, it certainly could not have been done away with at the cross. Okay, Barb, can you speak to us more about the immutability of God's law? Absolutely. Um, I, was, I was sitting here thinking as you were talking that God's plan really was to replicate his government from heaven on earth. Yes. Yeah. And so if, as, we, as we look at it, um, God does not change, does he? And so he wanted the, the same principles or laws that he has in heaven, he replicated here. So th there, there isn't a difference between here and heaven as far as God's government is concerned. I want to go say, talk about this immutability again one more time because I think it's important that we remember this. I think this is really a, a, a key principle in, in today's lesson. So immutability means, again, what? unchangeable. It's unable to change. It's not capable or susceptible to change. And so <clears throat> um, let's take a look at some, some scriptures now. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Somebody want to read that for me? Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them. For surely I say to you, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Yes. And there's there's a uh, there there are those out there who say the law was done away with at the cross. But this scripture really contradicts that, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. it says <clears throat> he says that he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets but he came to fulfill. Psalms 111, 7 and 8. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. So we see again, they stand for how long? Forever and forever. ever. Forever and ever, don't they? <clears throat> Ecclesiastes uh, 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God, and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Okay. Here it gets bottom lined. <laughs> Solomon bottom lines this. This is the conclusion of the whole matter. <clears throat> this is what we need to do. And so we see um, that keeping his commandments is, uh, is really God's, God's work for, for man. And 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. This is so important because when we look at God's commandments, it's not a list of you have to do this kinds of things. This is God's love language. And I think we forget that when we think, oh, we can't steal, we can't, we can't commit adultery, we can't do all these things. We look at the, we look at the Ten Commandments as a list of don'ts. But really, if we look at the, the Ten Commandments in the eyes of God, it's more you won't do these things out of love. And so God's commandments are really based on love, not on do's and don'ts. So I think well, it's... I think you did put it that way, love your neighbor, <coughs> love God, Yeah. Uh, because I think that there were some Jews at the time of Christ, like the rich young ruler who claimed to keep the law, but they only kept sort of the 
outward letter of the law, but inside they weren't really keeping the law. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, well, what lack I yet? He's like, these commandments I have kept since my childhood, but what lack I yet? So what he lacked is the love for his fellow neighbors. Well, I think, I think all of Israel had kind of had, had, had morphed into that. Um, everything was ritualized. And everything was um, letter of the law kind of, kind of attitude rather than the love principles that went behind it. I think that's a really good point. I didn't kill anybody yesterday. I didn't adultery. I didn't uh, covet anybody's stuff because I have more stuff than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, also let's move on to Proverbs 28.9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So if we don't want to listen to God's law, it, it, it's a problem. It's a problem for God to listen to us. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? Through Jesus, God's mercy was manifest. Oh, I'm reading Desire of Ages here. Through Jesus, God's mercy was manifested to man. But mercy does not set aside justice. The law reveals the attributes of God's character, and not a jot or tittle of it can be changed to meet man in his fallen condition. See, some, sometimes because of our fallen condition, we want to change things so it's easier for us. <laughs> but that, that's not how God works. God did not change his law, but he sacrificed himself in Christ for man's redemption. So we see that these passages, if you were to sum up these passages, how would you sum them up? Yeah. God's it's always what you have to follow. You can't change it can't take away or act to it. So yeah. It always has been, yes. and it always will be, if we, if we look at, at, the, at that, at that um, across time in these, in these texts. Also, um, in our lesson, there's an interesting uh, comment from the discourse of, of John Wesley in one of his sermons. And Seventh-day Adventists follow in the footsteps of the Protestant reformers who upheld the sanctity of God's law. Notice this powerful affirmation from Wesley here. The ritual or ceremonial law delivered by Moses to the children of Israel contained all the injunctions and ordinances which related to the sacrifices and service of the temple. Our Lord indeed did come to, did come to destroy, to dissolve, and utterly abolish. But the moral law contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets, he did not take away. So he took away the ceremonies, didn't he? And he did. He utterly destroyed those ceremonies. So he fulfilled them. And he, yeah, he fulfilled them. By so the ceremonies were pointing to him, and once he had already died on the cross, they were no longer necessary. Right. Yes. Um, so, um, but, but he did not take away his moral law. And the moral law is which law? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So it was not the design of his coming to revoke any part of this. This is, the, uh, this is a law which never can be broken, which stands fast as the faithful witness of heaven. As part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind and in all ages, as not deep depending either on time or place or on any other circumstance liable to change, but the nature of God and the nature of man and their unchangeable relationship to each other. And that's, that's important, too, when they talk about God's law being immutable. It's not, I, I like the way he said this here, um, it's not unchangeable relation to each other. I like that. So <clears throat> um, let's look at a couple more scriptures. Romans 7, 
uh, 11 and 12. Who would like to read that? For sin, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So we see that again, we see that the commandments are holy, just, and good. How about uh, Psalms 19, 7 through 11? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. More by them your servant is born, and in keeping them there is great reward. Yeah. So I, I like uh, verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Perfect. And what does it do? Converts the soul. Converts the soul. So I think that's important for us to remember, that keeping his law converts the soul. Mm -hmm. um, Psalms 89.14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and, and truth go before your face. Yeah. Yes. So here they're combining what? Justice and mercy. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we lose um, track of that, the difference between that, that God has both. God is a just God, but he's also a merciful God. Mm -hmm. There are those that think, that, that look at the Old Testament and see God as a, a vengeful God. Mm -hmm. And then they look in the New Testament and say, no, he's a, He's, he, he's, it's not about justice. He's, he's a merciful God, but he's both. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's important that we, we understand and, and maintain that relationship. Psalms 119, 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. So we see in all, so many of these scriptures this combination of law, justice, and mercy, don't we? Mm -hmm. And Psalms 119, 172. Somebody. Okay, my tongue shall speak your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Mm -hmm. So again, this, this, this theme of righteousness and justice. In the great controversy, it says, since the law of God is a transcript of his character, the foundation of his throne and the moral basis for humanity, Satan hates it. None could fail to see that if the early sanctuary was a figure or pattern of the heavenly, the law deposited in the ark on earth was an exact transcript of the law in heaven, in the ark in heaven. And that an acceptance of truth concerning the heavenly sanctuary involved an acknowledgement of the claims of God's law and the obligation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Here was the secret of the bitter and determined opposition to the harmonious, uh, harmonious opposition of scriptures that revealed, huh? Exposition. Thank you, exposition of scripture that revealed the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll talk I about. Back then, people were able to see that if they accepted the heavenly sanctuary, then they would have to accept the law, and they were unwilling to do that. So, but I think the Protestants' view on why they keep <laughs> Sunday to me is even shakier than the Catholics' view. At least the Catholics are like, well, God gave us the authority to change the law, and we did. At least that's simple. I understand that. The Protestants make these elaborate arguments, well, the disciples kept Sunday, and like, well, not as the Sabbath day, so they, they didn't substitute, and there's no scriptural evidence that they ever did. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think when John worshipped Jesus on the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day means the Sabbath. Because he even said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it definitely, it, John was, the Lord's Day was the Sabbath day. Yeah. And um, now we're going to move on to the Mark of the Beast. Yep. Yep. Okay, so the Bible teaches us a lot about the relationship between creation, Sabbath, and the law of God. They're very intertwined as part of the foundation of God. They cannot be <laughs> separated apart even though man tries. Um, it's just not possible to do so, and it's pretty clear in the Bible that that relationship is very intertwined. So let's read what the Bible says here. We'll go to Revelation 14, 6, and 7. Scott, would you mind reading that for me, please? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the spirit and the springs of water. Okay. So in these texts we see that we're commanded to worship our creator, right? It's pretty clear. Let's also read Revelation 14, 12. Yeah, do you have 14, 12? No, I'll, I'll read it. So that one says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. <coughs> so this tells us that God's faithful people, his saints, are going to keep the commandments of God. right? And then Revelation 4.11, if someone wants to read that for me. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. Okay, so God deserves our worship because he created us, and by him we exist. All right, let's read Genesis 2, 1 to 3. All right. so Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Okay, so we see here the Sabbath very intertwined with creation. The seventh day Sabbath at the very end of the creation week was sanctified or set apart for a holy use. Um, and so... Is it important to God? Yeah. Let's read Exodus 28 to 11, please. Anybody want to read that? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and that you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is in the gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in it is in him, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, so it starts out by saying remember, which means that probably it was given, the people knew about it before he gave them the Ten Commandments, right? So he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Mm -hmm. It could mean, as in, remember that I gave you this law before, but it could also mean, lest you should have the tendency to forget it in the future, remember it. But I think it yeah. has both meanings. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree with that. So it's important to God, and he called out it specifically different than how he started the other nine commandments. He said, remember to do this. And why does he say to do it? He says, because the Lord is our creator and has authority over us, um, and he wants to have that relationship with us. It's by bringing us together weekly in Sabbath that we set aside time from the busyness of our week and all the cares of the world, that we set aside time to spend with him, that he can draw closer to us and bless us abundantly. It, 
and, and we'll talk about, you know, how it, it is, it's a sign between God's true believers and his followers um, versus, you know, others who may not, right? So creation tells us of the value in God's sight. He created us to be in a relationship with him, and he purposely set aside a day each week for that purpose. God is worthy of our worship not only because he created us, but also because he redeemed us. Creation and redemption are at the heart of all true worship of God. Therefore, the Sabbath is vital to understanding the plan of salvation. It's a weekly memorial of our Creator and our Redeemer's love for us. And at the end of Creation Week, God rested as an example for us, a weekly <coughs> pause to praise and open our hearts to Him without the distractions of everyday life. Sabbath is an eternal symbol of our rest in Him as well. Let's look at Ezekiel 20, 12, 19, and 20. Someone want to read that? Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Okay. So God, God says that he's the Lord who sanctifies us. So we, we read that he sanctified the seventh day <clears throat> Sabbath. He set it apart to make it for a holy purpose. He also do, does that for us. He sanctifies us. He sets us apart for a holy purpose for him. And it's through us worshiping him on the day that he set apart for us that we are abundantly blessed. And um, obedience to God's commandments, including that seventh-day Sabbath, it's a blessing for us. He's able to perform and complete his sanctifying work in our lives when our obedience is in harmony with his law. Another point this brings out is that the Sabbath is a symbol, a, a Sabbath day is a symbol that we rest in him and it's not our own works that we trust in, but it's his promise to complete his good work in us. And in preparing us for heaven, um, that's part of that sanctifying work. And then the true Sabbath rest is the rest of grace in the loving arms of God, the one who created us, the one who redeemed us, and the one who is coming again for us. In regards to the Sabbath rest is that one question no Protestant has ever been able to answer me is why didn't Jesus resurrect on Saturday morning? He was done with his work of redemption, correct? So why, why did he wait till Sunday? He did say that it's going to be three days in the middle of the fish like Jonah too, but... Yes. But I think there was a reason for it, so I think he was reinforcing the Sabbath rest rather than doing away with it by, I thought he, he would have been perfectly in accord with the Sabbath for him to be resurrected on the Sabbath since he had taught that doing good was allowed on the Sabbath. So for sure, him being resurrected would have been allowed. It's just he chose to reinforce it by resting from the work of redemption as well. Yeah. Interestingly though, I've actually talked to a couple of people here about it. If you read the Greek, First day of the week, it seems like he's not there on, uh, on the, his resurrection. It just says Sabbath. So I like people to research that more, that have more knowledge about it than me. But. So it could be that he resurrected first day, I mean, on Saturday. Yeah. Well, because when the ladies go to the tomb, they actually, um, after the Sabbath, on the first day of the morning of the first day, they go to the tomb and it's empty. And then they say, he's not here, he's risen. So. Um, there's at least a good 12 hours of nighttime on Sunday. The first day had already passed before that daybreak. So, yeah. Yeah, I asked actually a person that speaks Greek, asked him, is the first day of the week in that end? He said no. So, but it's ancient see? Greek. Anyways, that's yeah. not separate. Okay. Well, mine is different, though. Okay. That, as we can see, the other word Sabbaths are very brutal. Mm -hmm. Is that including the ceremonial Sabbaths? He doesn't sanctify them through the ceremonial Sabbaths. The cer ceremonial Sabbaths were there for a purpose for the feast days. But his Sabbath days 
week to week are that sanctifying purpose. That's how I understand it. Do you understand it differently, Barb? Because no. he only made the Sabbath day the, you know, the end of the creation day to be a sign between me and you, not the feast day Sabbath. He only created one Sabbath and then the He he did, but we memorialize it every week. Yeah. So uh, I'm kinda confused on that one when it's says feast a week. So every week Sabbath. So it occurs. So because at the time that creation, when that happened and that seventh day Sabbath sanctified it, right? There was none of the feast or anything like that at that point in time. That actually came later. So <laughs> it has to be the seventh day Sabbath. I mean yeah. Yeah, the, the, fest, the, the festival of Sabbath didn't happen until after Sinai. Yeah, and then they were abolished, um, you know, after the cross. And they were never set apart as sanct of sanctifying purpose for the people. I mean, there was a, obviously a purpose and a blessing to the feast. They, they recalled for the people different events so that they would have a better understanding of the the work of redemption but when christ came and gave that living example the the testimony of his life those were no longer needed because he fulfilled all those the reason i brought that up mm -hmm. is because uh, you know i've had some people mm -hmm. from other denominations mm -hmm. that Why does it say Sabbath? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you if you look at that word sanctify and you tie it back to what we just talked about in Genesis, like that was that was the day he sanctified, and that is part of if you look all the way back to Revelation we studied, that is you know part of those ten commandments and the three angels' message in terms of who to worship, right? And so it's that Sabbath day, that day of creation. Um, so I know it's plural there. I didn't go to look at the Greek and go deep, deeper to understand. Um, well, actually, that would be the Hebrew. Um, so that might be a worthy study, but that's at least, you know, the understanding I have from the Bible. Um, <clears throat> to kind of close out this day, uh, the, the Sabbath day, worshiping the Sabbath day, is just not for our time here on earth. We will do this for eternity. Let's look at Isaiah 66, 23. And that says, and it shall come to pass from that one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. Right? So the Sabbath rest reminds us that one day the splendors of Eden will be restored. And we will live with God and commune face to face. And we will come together each Sabbath to worship him for eternity. And Sabbath gives us a glimpse of our future with Christ. Um, I do have something here from Desire of Ages, but I, I think, do we have time? Okay. So this is page uh, 288 in Desire of Ages. It says Sabbath is a sign of Christ's sanctifying power. So she says, Wherefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. That comes from Matthew 12, 8. These words are full of instruction and comfort. Because the Sabbath was made for man, it is the Lord's day. It belongs to Christ. For all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Since he made all things, he made the Sabbath. By him it was set apart as a memorial of the work of creation. It points to him as both the creator and the sanctifier. It declares that he who created all things in heaven and in earth and by whom all things hold together is the head of the church and that by his power we are reconciled to God. For speaking of Israel, he said, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them, which makes them holy. Then the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy, and it is given to all whom Christ makes holy. As a sign of his sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all who through Christ become a part of the Israel of God. Okay. Go ahead. Exodus 31 kind of 
goes through this again, but it pretty much eliminates the fact that these could be ceremonial Sabbaths. It does start out in verse 13. It says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, verily my Sabbaths shall you, plural, shall you keep as a sign between me and uh, you and throughout your generations. Uh, then it says, Ye shall keep the Sabbath. Immediately in verse 14, it goes to singular, you shall keep the Sabbath. Then uh, it goes down in six days and work was done. And then it goes down to say, it, not plural, but it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. So it does say Sabbaths, but it's mm -hmm. really not talking about the ceremonial Sabbaths if you compare scripture to scripture. Thank you. That's, that's a great explanation. That, and that was Exodus 31? Yeah, Exodus 31. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Barb, uh, can you tell us about the mark of the beast? We can. So when we look at the mark of the beast and we look at God's government and we boil it down, we talked about this at the very beginning, but many of you weren't here yet. It's all about, you can boil it down into one word, worship. Yes, worship. So the mark of the beast is truly about worship. So we've got a lot of text to go through. So um, let's get started here. Revelation 12.12 12 says what? Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So we look at this, this, this the devil looking out of, when he, when he comes out of the earth and out of the sea, what time period on earth's history are we looking at now? We're well, looking. The beast coming out of the earth was representing the second beast, the United States. When did the, when did the United in States come into being? 1790s. So, so yeah. the late, late uh, 18th century. Yeah. 1776 would be the year you're looking for. Well, yes, but I think <laughs> 17, 1798 is where the prophetic time of the end began. Yeah. 1290 so I was trying to mm -hmm. say that the two times were similar. Yeah. Well, uh, you're, you're, in, you're in, a, in a range here. Anyway. You have to realize that. 17, 1776 and all that, right? Then they mm -hmm. win the war, and then still nations have to actually acknowledge the United States as a real nation and not just a fluke. And so by the time that actually happens, it fits into the prophecy. So we're looking at, at hundreds of years, not thousands of years here, right? Yeah. So, um, so the devil has a short time, and he has been here for how long? How long has he been? When was he created? We don't know, but before the earth. Before the earth. Or before life on earth. Right. So for him, who has lived the span of years from before creation to come down looking at the time frame he has now, which is we're down into the hundreds of years from our time, he sees his time shortened, doesn't he? So his time is getting shorter. So as we look at this, we see that he knows that, that the culmination of things is about to happen. And if, we, if we, those of us who pay attention to prophecy are seeing the signs of the end coming upon us almost daily now in, in, great, in great waves. <laughs> okay, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with, was enraged with the woman and went to wait war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. And so he's, he's mad. And the woman is who? Church. The church, isn't it? So what's he doing? Yeah, he knows his time is short. And his attitude is, if I'm going, I'm taking everybody I can with me. And this is, this is really his mindset now. Yes? Because really, can he be 
back at God, or can he, is he going to win against God? He's already done that round, right? He lost miserably. So the only thing he can do now is to attack God's children. That's the only way he can hurt God. Yeah. So he's good at it. Well, he's, he's tenacious, too, because even though he knows his ultimate outcome, he still is deceiving people to believe <clears throat> that there's another, there's another path to heaven, isn't he? Uh, Revelation 13, 7. It was granted him to what? Make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so we see that this, that Revelation 12 really outlines, outlines the cosmic, cosmic conflict. Then we get into Revelation 13 that introduces the, the two dragons' allies, the beast from the sea and the beast from the land. And so let's take a look at some of these scriptures in Revelation 13. Who wants to read, do some reading here? Go ahead. So they worshiped the dragon who gave the authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So we see, don't we, that, <clears throat> that there is a, a bit of awe coming from the world. About, uh, 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 around this beast, is, uh, isn't there? But I think nowadays the beast has become almost like a positive thing. Uh, you know, we have Beauty and the Beast, we have Mr. Beast on YouTube, and we have all kinds of other beasts. So, like, if a car is a beast, it means it's, like, very fast. Yeah. So, uh, so now it's become a positive, but here it's not very positive. <laughs> Uh, Revelation 13, 8. You want to keep going? All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So are we seeing that more and more? Are we seeing more and more people turning from God and worshiping other things? We're seeing... Yeah. Like yeah. And so they feel God. They're, they're not atheists, but they're worshiping the wrong God. In fact, in Revelation, there's three entities that are worshipped in Revelation 13. The dragon, they worship the dragon of Mount Brown, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And they worship the beast here. And then they actually, the land beast causes them to worship the image of the beast. They actually worship the image of the beast, yeah. which is what Sunday keeping. Mm -hmm. So these are false gods that are have the pretense of God. They're not just, you know, my Cadillac or my Corvette and that sort of thing, or my television watching. But that's what I, I'd like to bring real quick back to verse 6 and 7 of Revelation 14 we just read. The first angel's message, I've raised in Adventist, and I never really quite understood the first angel's message. Second's easy, third's easy. What's the first? And I was told it was the uh, 1844 uh, hour of judgment is done. But that's actually not the main message of the first angel. The first angel, I'll make it real clear. The first chapter just before this was don't worship them the dragon, don't worship the beast, and don't worship the image of the beast. By the way, worship him who created the heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains and the water. That's the one you worship. And when God in the Old Testament was competing with Baal and all these other gods, he always had to identify himself. And in the New Testament, he does the same thing, which is amazing. We also think the first angel's message is a, is a reiteration of the Sabbath, which it is. That's that's only the identification of the real message. Don't worship these other three false entities in the chapter before. Worship the real God, created heaven, earth, and sea, and fountain of water. So of the three choices, the, the judgment of, has come, mm -hmm. or remember the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. The real first sentence message is don't worship anything but God. Mm -hmm. Because right now, 
the, most of the Christian world is worshiping one of the images, one of the beasts, or one of the entities in chapter 13 yeah. right now. The majority of God's church, that verse uh, 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 four, uh, 12, 14, 17, 12, 17. The world, the, the, the woman is all the people that are out there doing the wrong thing. But the remnant are those that keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus. And they're the ones that actually get made war with. He's wroth with the others. And they will be called out because they actually hear his voice, even though they aren't, they've been deceived up to now. They will hear his voice and get called out. That's a huge amount of people. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's why our focus as Christians needs to be on God's government and what is the fa that's why we're just we're studying the foundation of God's government because it's really about keeping mm -hmm. the law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the and and following and loving God and having a relationship with God and understanding these relationships between law mercy justice mm -hmm. and and a walk with God yes <coughs> days of Israel, uh, people worshipped Satan through all these fake gods like Baal and Molech and Ashtoreth, but now uh, he, he's gotten more clever, so now he actually, he's the cosmic Christ. He's not Jesus Christ, but the cosmic Christ, and people are actually worshipping a false Christ who will in the end come and tell him, oh, blessed are you who keep me on my holy day Sunday I have changed this law but that would be the imposter Christ so I think that makes it more difficult to discern because now people are worshiping not some pagan name by some other name but they're worshiping Jesus Christ but it's not the Jesus Christ it's a Jesus Christ who's actually Lucifer disguised as Christ which will come culminate in him actually showing up as Christ, but Christ is giving you a sign. He's like, if he shows up in a secret chamber or in the desert, don't even listen. He, it's not me. It's, it's the fake Christ. One of, one of the things that, that, now that you mentioned that, when I do, when I'm doing Bible studies with, with um, people who are, are, are coming to Christ, when we talk about this, this piece of a false Christ, what do we remember about Christ when he comes in the clouds? Every eye will see him, but his feet don't touch the ground. That's his right. feet don't touch the ground. But you know what? The Bible is saying not only how, but when I see him, he will. Because he had to, to be sucked in by that one. Uh, your statement is a little better. Every eye will see him. He's going to be uh, He's going to be in Brazil. And then he's going to be in such and such a country. That's kind of the thing that I think is, he's not going to be able to totally Yeah. Uh, Improvise or be exact to the Christ coming, but I think he could deceive us on that. Feet won't touch the ground. Thing. I, if I were him, I wouldn't touch the ground. So he's going to be spectacular. That's one of the things that could be really spectacular. Hey, he's hovering. That that could be a little fakey for us Adventists. Yeah. The Bible also tells us that the the elements of the earth are going to melt at his coming. Right. The the atmosphere is going to be ripped apart. Yeah, you know. but that's going to be the very, very end. I mean, yeah, but we, we know that that's a sign, right? So if if they say, you know, Satan's over there, you know, and we look around us, and I'm like, well, there's still a sky above, and there's still trees, and there's all this stuff. Like, that can't be true, right? That's also another identifying mark. But, but right now, <clears throat> what we're seeing, I mean, is that most of these false Christs, and these, these folks who, who say they're Christ are walking around on this earth. And people are being deceived by them. We look at the Jim Joneses of the world, the hale Bop Comet guy down here in, in Orange County. And they are all over the world right now, people who are saying they're Christ. Yeah, but I think when Lucifer impersonates him, he's going to do a really good job. He's going to really heal people and really do some amazing miracles to even the Christian world is going to acknowledge him and that the Christ has come. Plus, the people who believe that 
Christ's going to cut usher in this millennium of peace. Mm -hmm. This is going to go right in with them, and he's going to agree with them. Yes, I did change my Sabbath. And, and those guys, they're, they're the ones who are refusing to worship me by hanging on to this Old Testament Sabbath. Yeah. We as Adventists have to be careful because we think uh, we're so solid on the fact that Christ won't touch the earth. But, but the evangelicals have scriptures that say he will stand on Mount Zion. They don't realize that this is after the millennium, but they don't, they believe the, that, like you said, we're getting, they're getting ready to usher in a thousand years of peace on this earth. So they're going to be deceived. They, they believe this, this uh, everything in Revelation is gonna happen to the Jews, and so it has nothing to do with us. They're not even looking to this. They're, so Adventists are going to be really under pressure because they're, they're going to throw scripture at us. No, yeah. it says here that Jesus will come and stand on Mount Zion. And we're going to think, well, were we misled? We, we need to be really solid on what, where we're coming from and what we believe. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to pick out scriptures now because our time is short here um so then the next phases um that we see with uh coming in revelation <clears throat> when we get into revelation 15 and 16 what we're seeing here um <clears throat> start talking about god's judgments um <clears throat> and in, in verse in chapter 16 2 we'll see that the the plagues start so at the begin at, 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 we'll, we'll see the Antichrist will see the plagues as well come and um, it says so the first went and poured his bowl on the earth and foul loathsome sores came upon men who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped his image so we're going to see that those who take the mark of the beast are going to be, <clears throat> be struggling with these plagues. And one of the things we want to make sure, I want to make sure that everybody is clear on is what the mark of the beast is. And I'm going to, we're going to do that and then I'm, we're going to move on to Thursday. <laughs> <clears throat> And it, it's really interesting because if, if we know what God's mark is, um, then we know what the mark of the beast is. And I go back to <clears throat> Deuteronomy 6, and I'm, it's not going to be up here. Um, and Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8, we see that God says, And thou shalt teach your, their, them unto your children. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest in thy way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And you shall bind them as a sign. Sign and mark are interchangeable as we, as we study this in the, in, in the Bible. You, it, and thou shalt bind them as a sign upon thine hand, and thou shalt be frontlets between thine eyes, so be, on your forehead, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of your doorhouse and upon thy gates. So it's believing your hands are what? What you, actions. actions. And what, what do we do up here? Thoughts and beliefs. It's actually beliefs, more beliefs than our thoughts, but <clears throat> because our beliefs drive our thoughts. So as we look at this mark and, the, and this seal, God says that on the hand, the, the, that his commandments on the hand and in the forehead are his, are his sign, his mark. And so the beast has his mark and his sign. And that is, um, um, that is following anything but God, basically. So yep. that, was, and, that and was a lot for yeah. one for that, that is for one day that is so we're, we're going to talk about the three angels message now and j just kind of you know continuing on from what you were talking about with the mark of the beast um you know we're going to read about the people who are 
you know, standing unmovable during this time of great trouble on the earth. And the only thing that really makes it possible for them to do that is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They have fully committed their lives and, and submitted their lives to Christ, and it's only because of that. No human being could withstand the pressure that will be upon the, the people of God at the end of time, um, or, or, or on, on all people, right? Recently, we saw a, a, a compelling of you know, certain actions you know, by, by the government. We think that was you know, a big thing and an anomaly for our life. We're gonna see far more than that in the coming future. And so only through a submitted life to Christ can you withstand that because it's his power, not ours, that gives us that power to do that. So in the three angels' message, um, you know, as Adventists, we often talk about the three angels' message, and we, we surely believe that it's our mission to proclaim the, the good news and the gospel of God and this message to the world. You know, but this message is given with utmost urgency by God, um, and he proclaims that it's time for him to worship him. And I like what you said. It's just like in those first couple verses, he calls you back to who is the true God, Right. And he, has, he definitely has a sign of who that is. So let's, um, let's read through Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Um, I know it's familiar, but it's worth reading through again. And look at the two opposing choices that are presented in this message. It's worship of the creator or worship of the beast. And every person is going to make their final irrevocable decision over who is going to have their total allegiance, Christ or Satan. And God does not want us to be deceived, so he gives us this, this message before the time comes so that he can warn us and proclaim his love for us. So let's read Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Somebody want to do that? Go ahead. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and springs of waters. And another angel followed, a second one followed, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night, those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the per perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we see here in verse 12 two identifying characteristics of those who choose to worship the true God and not, not the beast. What are those characteristics? That's right, that's right. Keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Um, verse 7 tells us who the true God is, and who is that? That's right, that's right. So in, in Tuesday's lesson, we talked about that it is the God of creation um, that you know, Genesis talks a lot about, and, the, and it's also the God who wrote the, his commandments on the two tables of stone in the Exodus. And the New Testament reveals that the creator God is Jesus Christ. And the fourth commandment specifically tells us that God, our creator, wants to come into a relationship uh, with us and worship him on the seventh day. So let's kind of take that thread and look at John 1, 1 to 4, 14. Somebody want to read that? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and life, or, and the life was the light of men. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we behold his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so through the Bible we see like an onion being peeled away, a revelation of who this creator God is, right? And, and this clearly states that, yeah, um, that the word or Christ um, was with God before the beginning and he came and dwelt among us and he was the one that created all things. Psalms 47 and 8. Want someone want to read that? Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Okay, so who's this talking about? Who, who, who is the scroll of the book written about? It's about Jesus, right? Christ came to do the will of the Father, right? So the second characteristic of the saints is that they have this faith of Jesus. What does it mean to have the faith of Jesus? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can't do that without him. No. Yeah, that's for sure. It's, it's in the uh, opposition to having faith in Jesus is good, and we should have that, but it's not what it's saying here. Yeah, that's right. We have the faith of Jesus. That's correct. Yeah. So what does that really mean? to have it without him. Yeah. It's so Christ, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes, it is. So, you know, really the faith of Jesus is revealed in his life and ministry and his sacrifice, right? Um, in John 17, 18, Christ says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So he's our example in how he lived his life. He, he, he came to reveal the Father. That was his singular purpose. And through that revelation, he, he sacrificed a sacrifice that none of us will be asked, asked to sacrifice, right? And so he is our example of what that means. And that's really what the faith of the Father is. He did nothing except that it was by the Father's will. That is how we are to live our life. John 5, 19, in, as Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Do we live our days like that? Something to ponder. So having the faith like Jesus means living a life fully and completely submitted to Christ, who gave us a perfect example through his life and sacrifice. This faith of Jesus is a gift we receive by faith. It will carry us through the trials and joys of life and also through the coming crisis of Earth's final hours until Jesus returns. Um, okay, I think that's it for Thursday. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah. Those messages to me, it also seemed like one message that that's... Um, implied in there, but maybe not. Well, I guess it is explicitly said, which is that the tables are going to turn. He's going to turn it from God's people being persecuted to God's going to persecute the enemies. So now all of God's people will be saved and everybody else is going to get plagues. Like it was in Egypt. So all of a sudden he turns the tables upside down. He's like, okay, now I'm going to persecute the world. statements here from Alan White here regarding the law. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testament that is Moses' Ark and is still there, safely hidden from the human family. But in God's appointed time he'll bring forth these tables of stone to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship of his counterfeit Sabbath. So these tables of stone will be revealed in the yeah. that has some conflict between the good, the true Sabbath and the false Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah, at, at the end of time, the, the events that God, you know, orchestrates, because God is sovereign over all affairs of man in, in the world, 
right? The Bible tells us that he sets up kings and he takes them down. And, it, and he's always, Satan might be warring against him, but he's always moving towards his purpose. What we read in Revelation 14 is that there's no one standing on a middle ground anymore. They're either worshiping God or they're worshiping, or they're not worshiping, they're worshiping the beast, right? And they've made a choice and it's irrevocable. And so events like that and whatever God el else God brings about, he is going to, the Bible tells us in Revelation, he is going to reveal the, who the beast is. And it is going to be clear to people the choice that they are making. Now they may be very deceived in their belief and they choose the, not to worship God, but he is going to reveal to him his power and who he is, like he did to Pharaoh. He revealed himself to Pharaoh through the plagues, showing his power, but yet Pharaoh chose to harden his heart and not submit his will to God. And that is going to be the demarcation at the end. Yeah. All right. Okay. So as we look at this lesson today on God's government, and this great controversy. What is the core issue? Worship. If we remember nothing else from today, we need to remember that the core issue is who are we going to worship? Because that, that issue of worship is the difference between following God and following the beast. I'm going to read from Great Controversy. It's actually the introduction of Great Controversy and our final thoughts today. The great controversy between good and evil will increase in intensity to the very close of time. So it's going to continue to get worse. I think we just need to, to, to grasp that. In all ages, the wrath of Satan has been manifested against the Church of Christ, and God has bestowed his grace and spirit upon his people to strengthen them to stand against the power of the evil one. When the apostles of Christ were to bear his gospel to the world and to record it for all future ages, they were especially endowed with the enlightenment of the spirit. But the church approaches her final deliverance, but as the church approaches her final deliverance, Satan is to work with greater power. He comes down having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He will work with all power and signs and lying wonders. And we see that in Second Thessalonians. For 6,000 years, that mastermind that once was the highest among the angels of God has as as been wholly bent to work the work of deception and ruin. And all the depths of satanic skill and subtly acquired, all the cruelty developed during the struggles of the ages will be brought to bear against God's people in the final conflict. And in this time of peril, the followers of Christ are to bear the world, the warning of the Lord's second advent. And a people are to prepare to stand before him at his coming without spot and blameless. At this time, the special endowment of divine grace and power is not less needful to the church than it was in the apostolic days. So we need... As, as, we, as we think about this issue of worship, something that goes hand in hand is we have to have the Holy Spirit in our lives because with, with, we, we need that strength because we don't have that strength on our own. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yes? I think the love of money is being demonstrated in our society right now in a way that it never has before. All of these powerful people are supporting a certain person in the political arena because of what that person can do for them in terms of deregulation, which affects all of us, and what that person can do for them in terms of their power. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it all happen. And if we put money above God, we are not going to be there. We're not going to be in heaven. And I've often wondered if our participation in corporate, in the way of investments, if God is going to hold us liable for what those corporations do. 
I don't know. We don't know. Well, if our main focus is truly the three angels' messages and what God is telling you to do in relation to those three angels' messages, and we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and we're sharing those messages with the world, I think that is really more important than how we invest our money. Um, I, I, know that people, I know that people are giving to politicians right now. I know that, um, that the world is, and it's not just a person, it's many people that their, their money is going to. But our, we have to remember, our, our home is not here on this earth, is it? No. Our home is in heaven. And so where our focus needs to lie is how we get there. And like Satan wants to take everybody with him, we want to take everybody with us to heaven, right? So um, on that note, our time is past, so let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you again for this Sabbath day, for this very serious uh, lesson that we've had, Lord. We want to be part of your government, Lord. That's why we're here. We want to follow you wherever you go. And we want to have your mark in our foreheads and in our hands, Lord. We pray that you would be with us this Sabbath, that it will be a holy and high Sabbath, and that we will continue to work for you, that we will continue to uh, spread your three angels' message throughout the world. Thank you for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, there's an offering plate in the back.